Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's Sense of Feely Sparring Partners webinar, Power Efficiency in Private Networks and IoT. Our speakers today are Dr. Mike Short, Chief Architect, Satellite Applications at Catapult, and Monica Paulini, Principal at Sense of Feely. I'm Kendra Chamberlain, and I will be moderating our webinar today. In Sparring Partners webinars, we watch our speakers discuss a topic live on video. We'd like to encourage our audience to participate in the conversation. Please share your comments and questions using the Q&A and chat buttons on the Zoom taskbar. All comments are visible to all participants, so please keep the conversation polite and respectful. Our speakers will do their best to address questions as they go along and as they become relevant to the topics being discussed. So please do not hold your questions until the end. And with that, I'll hand it over to Monica. Kendra, thank you so much uh, for uh, the introduction. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here again today, as it always is. Um, and this is a, a second uh, sparring partners that we're doing on energy efficiency. And the first one is already available for you to watch here. And then we're going to have another one on uh, power efficiency um, in uh, Open RAN. So is Open RAN going to be more energy efficient or less? And uh, this is sort of uh, um, unusual because as parent partners, we try to get different topics every time, but this is uh, uh, because I'm writing a report and I'm really got fascinated with uh, uh, energy efficiency. So uh, I hope you will find it uh, just as compelling as uh, I do and actually Mike does since he's been doing a lot of work on this. And um, uh, so today um, we are going to, uh, um, uh, very pleased to talk to Mike for, for various reasons. Um, and uh, I would say the most uh, immediate one uh, is the fact that he has been uh, involved in um, in a set of uh, webinars uh, organized by TAC UK on energy efficient networks that was uh, inc incredibly useful uh, and uh, inspiring set of webinars. And so it's, uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to have him since he's been contributing and, and working on it. So this is sort of the short term uh, uh, reason why I'm pleased to have him, but the, 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 the deeper reason is that I've known Mike for a long time. He is a visionary, so not only he knows everything about telecoms, but he also has a vision for the future. And uh, uh, when it comes to energy efficiency, this is really important because this, this is all new stuff. And uh, he also, so he has a lot of experience in wireless, but also in all the uh, adjoining fields uh, that we will be talking about today. So today we're going to talk about telcos and wireless, but also how that impacts everything else. And uh, we are very lucky that Mike is just starting a new job. So I'd like to congratulate him on that. And uh, uh, I would like to ask him what is he doing. So he used to work uh, for the uh, UK government as a chief scientist, and now he is a chief architect uh, at uh, uh, with the satellite applications catapult in the UK. And I can say what it is, but I think Mike can do it better. And Mike, maybe you can tell us what is it you're going to be working on now. Sure. Um, I'm working very actively as chief architect for the satellite applications catapult, uh, particularly around areas of energy efficiency across the mobile and satellite boundaries. That does require some uh, attention to issues such as coverage, but also uh, how the network management works between the modes of cellular and satellite. It also requires attention to standards. Uh, but actually, when we look at coverage gaps, for example, it's quite energy efficient to look across those boundaries uh, to look at combinations of those networks. Absolutely. And can you tell us what the catapult is? So uh, like, we have a, for we have people a, that are not from the UK that might not know about that. No, we, we have a series of nine catapults in the UK specializing in different technologies. Uh, we've, for example, got a digital uh, catapult that does specialize in telecoms. Uh, we've also got a high value manufacturing catapult. So these are large innovation centers that bridge across between business and government with demonstrators, with some research activities, 
uh, they're innovation centers in another in another word. Yeah, and what I like, I'm just learning about it, is that it's really um, on top of a lot of work. It, it's also a community where people go and uh, discuss and share ideas, which is uh, uh, I think really cool. Um, so okay, good. So let let's get started. And um, uh, you know, uh, one of the maybe one place to start is uh, uh, in your presentation at the uh, webinar that I mentioned. Uh, you showed a picture of how consumption in wireless networks is is going up. Uh, so you know the the expectation is going to double, and and so this is sort of a, a something that it's it's a well known fact. GSMA data, so you're not making it up. It's real thing, but uh, people uh, very rarely talk about this. And so there, there is a, a situation where we do use more energy because we're doing more. Uh, but so there is a question, of, you need to increase efficiency rather than just trying to reduce consumption. I mean, you cannot reduce consumption because we're, again, we're doing more. So maybe we can start in how do we, how should we think about that? Are we the bad guys because we're using more energy? No, I don't think we're the bad guys. I, th I think the mobile operators are geared towards servicing and supporting their customers. And if they want to uh, make more usage of any type, uh, it's for their choice and their, their, their service that the operators are there to serve. But in particular, we see the data traffic as being one of the key reasons why people are investing in 5G. If the data traffic growth is there, more capacity is needed, more capability is needed, particularly to deliver more content. So if the data traffic goes up, the energy goes up in line with that, unless we give it some attention. The other reason why energy is a key parameter is it's a key aspect of OPEX or operational costs. So as the energy costs per unit go up, there's a double effect of costs rising through data traffic, as well as the unit costs going up of energy itself. So in combination, it's very important to monitor and measure the energy usage, but also then to manage it where you can. And there are different techniques to do that. Yes, and, and I guess uh, maybe just from the start, we should talk about you know energy consumption, you know, how much you consume, period, and efficiency, which are two very different ways to look at it. And how, how should we go about it? Well, I, I think if we measure the consumption, uh, we can obviously see uh, through customers' bills how much energy is being used indirectly. There is a relationship between the data consumed or passed over the networks as well as the cost. Uh, so, so we can look at the pure consumption. Uh, sometimes there are, in uh, telecoms terms, all-you-can-eat plans, so unlimited data plans. Uh, if somebody has an unlimited data plan, you might see high levels of usage in line with that data plan. You might then say, let's price it so that uh, some of the data can be optimized across the network, maybe encouraging off-peak usage. That's traditionally been used in telecoms for many years. Uh, maybe nighttime usage rather than daytime usage. So, so moving the peaks is quite useful. In addition to that, through pricing, you can encourage uh, different combinations of networks. It's no longer just a mobile network, it could be a Wi-Fi network. So how can you do things like offload across different networks? In some of the satellite work I do, uh, we look at some combinations of mobile and satellite technology to look at whether you can use those in combination to actually manage the uh, usage more effectively before you get into some of the usage costs or energy costs itself. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, oftentimes when you think about, uh, when people talk about energy efficiency, you just look at uh, uh, the, the, the energy consumption per bit. But even that, it really depends on, you know, as I say, it's not so much the traffic, it's how the traffic is distributed across time, networks, location. And so there is a lot that, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can do there. So it, even that, that seems like an obvious way to measure efficiency, it, it's not a straightforward, uh, it's, it's a good starting, I guess I'm saying it's a good starting point, but there is more that you need to dig down to understand what that number means. How yes, if you if you understand the demand side of usage, it's a lot easier to think about what can be done on the supply side, whether it's the operator control or the uh, or the vendor equipment used by the operators. 
uh, sometimes in some networks you can put certain channels into sleep mode so that they're not always uh, uh, ready and available throughout the night for example when maybe usage is low um, you could also imagine how you could optimize the traffic to go through certain uh, switching nodes or control nodes uh, you can also imagine whether you tilt the usage between uplink and downlink you can start to imagine whether some can be store and forward types of solutions. So there's a range of techniques available when it comes to network management that can be applied. But you've got to understand the demand first before you can do that. Absolutely. And, and that, that is actually quite tricky because the demand also depends on availability cost. So it's all, and I guess that what that points is that we need to have a sort of end to end sort of whole um, approach to energy is not just getting a piece of equipment that is more energy efficient, which is clearly a good thing, but you don't want to stop there. Yes, I, I think it fits in the category of systems engineering, managing the mm -hmm. system itself from an energy efficiency point of view. But again, it does depend on your understanding the demand in the first place. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to block calls or turn off networks uh, when you're there to provide a service. So it's optimizing the calls really within the network with the tools available. Uh, yeah. We can also see a need to optimize for climate change and net zero reasons, but, but, but you don't get there until you start with the basics of what's the demand and how do you manage the demand? Yeah, we're gonna go into the whole, you know, uh, IoT and private networks in, in a second, but since you mentioned satellite, before I forget, I wanted to ask you, how, how do you see the role of satellite? Because when you think about energy consumption, it's a, I guess that the model is somewhat different there that, you know, like cellular and Wi-Fi may be a little bit more similar, but what, what should we, how, how should we think about satellite in terms of power efficiency? Well, I think the start point is to say, why should the mobile operators work with satellite companies? And I think the first reason is coverage. You know, satellite may well be better in rural or remote areas or maybe over the sea. So it's a way of saving capital that you wouldn't necessarily put into cellular base stations if you offload to a satellite service. But as soon as you want to offload to a satellite service, you are then thinking about the network management systems that go across the two. So how do you make sure that the handover is ele um, elegant and effective? Um, today, there aren't many dual mode handsets between cellular and satellite, but increasingly we will see them come on the market because there are many new satellite constellations being built and companies such as Starlink and uh, OneWeb and indeed others will want to provide services direct to a handset, not just for emergency, but for coverage infill and for wider services. In some cases, these services might be satellite led with mobile support. It needn't be just mobile run completely. It could be led by the satellite companies themselves. In addition to that, we see satellite being beneficial for backhaul. It may be a, a more cost effective or energy efficient, cheaper way of doing backhaul within a network. So particularly remote locations, how do you connect a remote base station uh, back into the cellular network using satellite backhaul? So the options are very much on the wholesale or trade side, as well as on the retail end user side uh, in this area. Um, I'm sure we will see more roaming services automatically roaming from cellular to satellite and, and back again in the future. Again, this is a way of looking at energy differently across networks rather than within a single network. Okay, now let's try to talk a little bit more about, I mean, I can go on any tangent with you because you cover so much stuff. Uh, but I would like to remind the audience that we don't have Q&A at the end. We just have them rolling. So if you have any questions or you just want to have send any comment, do it now. Don't wait until the end. Um, so, but let, let's just start about thinking about how in wireless we enable more. I mean, we also want to try to be more energy efficient within the industry, but we can also enable increased efficient energy efficiency in other markets. And I guess utilities are the, the first one that comes to mind, uh, although that's not limited to that. Um, so what is uh, what, what is that utilities, how is that utilities can benefit from telcos and wireless in general? I would argue many energy companies need to go on a digital journey 
a digital journey that starts with measurement, but also looks at the supply side and the demand side. So if we think about energy companies, sometimes they're single fuel, just say electricity, but in some cases they may ingest wind supply or solar supply. So actually, how do you measure that wind and, and solar uh, as it comes into uh, an energy network such as an electricity network? How do you also control it? Uh, because there may be peak input of solar or wind based on how it's generated. How do you then add in the control mechanisms that uh, manage those inputs as well as the distribution of the energy from those sources? So that language of input and output is something in, tel in telco world uh, we've had for many years. Um, and I could see a strong case for the energy sector to digitize more fully for the control and management and distribution reasons I've just said. Uh, certainly, we need to get more efficient in a mixed fuel economy uh, in terms of having different sources. And the mixed fuel economy is only going to increase as we add in new uh, non-renewable sources or perhaps even nuclear and hydrogen type sources in the future. But it, but it has to have a control mechanism for the inputs and the outputs as well as the distribution. Um, I think you can see some digitization of energy networks for billing purposes, but you can't really see a lot towards control right now. Yes, absolutely. And and I guess this is sort of like in the same way that mobile networks are getting more complex, the energy was the distribution generation and distribution are getting more complex. So maybe let's let's start with the um, uh, um, the generation first, and then we go into the distribution. So it's different because the more renewable energies you have, the more the, the generation is going to be distributed in time and place, less even, and you need to coordinate everything. And what, one of the things that I learned that I thought was one of the most fascinating from utilities is how dependent they are on on time, I mean, real time information. So the whole grid can crash if you do not coordinate things, you know, in real time, really real time. Uh, so, you know, low latency is not just for gamers, it's, it's also for utilities. And, uh, and so this, this is really a different way. So connectivity is not just uh, connectivity within, you know, the, the place where you generate. It, it's the whole network coordinate and there are different sites. So you might have microsites, you have homes generating energy and then you have bigger sites. So the, the, the kind of complexity is way bigger. And, and so it, how, how do you deal with that in terms of like, if you're a utility, okay, they need to digitize, but what's the way, they, do they need to break, build their own infrastructure, use public networks? How, what's the best way to think about it? Well, I think the utilities have got choices as to whether they build their own networks or whether they work with specialists. Um, it may be sensible to start with specialists and then decide whether they want to build their own over time. Um, but, but if we also think about the storage from the generation point of view, that can be quite expensive. So it's quite important to think about what can you really store cost effectively. Uh, if you have wind power or solar power, for example, you may not wish to invest in batteries at the generation end. Uh, you might just want to ingest it and then deliver it. Uh, the generation and transmission going hand in hand. But but that saves money on the batteries or the storage, if you like. And in some cases, uh, batteries are not really a viable option. Um, in addition to that, I think we see some telcos beginning to say for their own networks, can they have more resilient energy supply themselves? Can they, for example, invest in solar farms to add resilience to their networks? And we see examples of that in, in the Nordic countries, in France today. But, but you would only do that if it has some genuine benefit to the mobile or fixed network operator. Uh, if it might reduce energy costs, if it adds to the resilience, why wouldn't you do it? Uh, so, so that is being experimented with and in some cases invested in already from the telco side. I think also from a generation point of view, uh, the, the telco networks are big customers of energy. But if better forecasting came about from the telcos into the energy companies, you can see some energy benefits in that area to even out the peak, uh, peaks of demand and supply to maybe manage the supply chain of energy more effectively. So I think there will be a need for better forecasting between the telco and the energy industries for energy requirements as well. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, there are so many directions, you know, that that you can think that that can go through. So, so clearly there is an element, you know, about the utilities themselves. So what they said they need to do regardless of, so they use the wireless infrastructure for their own operations, their own thing. But also there is wireless operators, as you say, they, they might be generating their own renewable energy and then, uh, uh, or use renewable energy. And so you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, some, Euro some Northern European countries passed, so how, how do you see that from a mobile operator point of view? What, how, how should they go about thinking about it? Well, yeah. I, think, I, I think the mobile operators or telcos should think about it from a, a usage first point of view and then think about how do they address the costs through an efficiency set of measures, uh, through the management tools. Um, I, I also uh, can see examples where as I said earlier, solar power has already been invested in quite simply to add that efficiency and resilience uh, in, into the telco network from a solar source. Um, and I think we'll see other examples of convergence between the energy and telco industries going forward. Why shouldn't, for example, data centers be co-located with networks? Why shouldn't, for example, some of the assets of uh, major sites for energy and telcos be more co-located to optimize the overall asset infrastructure? Um, it takes us both into how public networks can be tailored for a particular private use, but it also takes us into the potential of private networks in some cases where the energy company may wish to experiment, but also at some point, run the private network it doesn't always have to be led by the mobile operator it can sometimes be led by the the energy company and if we think about the internet of things that helps us to pick up through sensing some of the peak loads in areas like wind or solar and can sense it and control it in a more effective way uh, internet of things obviously is not just about energy but the sensing revolution is with us now and picking up big time and I guess that here it's, it's it's an interesting way to look at it because on one hand, having wireless connectivity, having IoT leads to you know more efficiency in whatever those uh, sensors are doing. So help some other some other vertical, but also it can help to really monitor the environment in general from a utility from connectivity any any way. So. How should we go? How important it is, you know, the sensing, the location. This is all new capabilities that we have in networks to be much more efficient in terms of being able to monitor the environment in general, on top of the specific thing that some, some sensors are doing, which is well, not just you, obviously it, If your wind is being generated offshore, you know, in the middle of the sea, you need to both control the uh, the generation of wind wherever you can but you need to have a view on the weather and sensing of the weather on a localized basis is very important looking at wind speed can be sensed and picked up uh, if we think about solar obviously it's not usually very good at night <laughs> so making sure we, we're quite clear that the solar power can be optimized based on the weather that's being sensed locally as well is quite important uh, whether it's day or night weather. Um, with regard to um, some of the other sensing capabilities, uh, we can obviously think about pollution, which may interfere with some of the issues to do with solar power, for example. Um, and certainly in environmental measurement, some of our cities already have many sensors already that are increasingly being connected for real-time use. So IoT really lends itself towards environmental sensing on a much broader basis than just weather and day and night. Absolutely. And, and I guess that there, uh, do you think, I mean, this is sort of hard to predict in a sense, but you, you see this more of a role of the utilities or the operators or third parties that are going to take the lead on this? I think it's all three, but I think the push is coming from a mixture of telco vendors and telco operators at the moment. Uh, I think in some countries which are advanced when it comes to energy efficiency, uh, the utilities might take a lead, but I think generally it's the telco vendors and operators that are probably leading in this area. Absolutely. Now, 
you mentioned uh, resiliency and uh, oftentimes, I mean, this is actually something that uh, people don't often mention, but clearly that's crucial. You need to preserve it or improve it. And you can make an argument that by using renewables, you might reduce uh, resiliency and reliability because uh, renewables are less, you know, it's more difficult to have a, a, a consistent supply. But on the other hand, they introduce diversity and therefore you might increase resilience, right? Or reliability. How do we think about it? Oh, in any case, what they do is that they change the way we think about it because the more sources of energy you have, the, the, the difference that the, the issue becomes, isn't it? Well, I think every business wants choices and it's no different in mobile or fixed networks. You want choices of energy wherever possible. Uh, choices help to control the cost just through choice. But there are some regulations that also apply in this area. Uh, telecoms networks are usually deemed as critical network infrastructure. They normally expect to have high reliability and high uptime. So it's quite natural for regulators to say you should have battery backup in uh, various base stations so that if the power does fail, the battery backup is there. Some of those battery backups are based on diesel generators because the grid may be unreliable in some parts of the world. Uh, so it starts to make you think, well, can we make the battery backup or diesel generators more reliable by having solar power on site, by having uh, maybe a small wind farm local to the base station so that the cost of the batteries might change, the cost of the generation may change. In some cases, it's very difficult to get uh, the diesel to a remote site. So it may be better to have more localized energy supply from whatever source is available. Um, so I think the way you think about it is to say, what resilience must you offer? And then what resilience do you want to offer? The must might be regulated, but the what you want to offer might be geared towards the different types of clients. If you've got, for example, um, a remote team doing surveying work, that finds that the communications link for their surveying work is absolutely vital, you may put in more resilience because of that. You might have night time workers, you might have people in mines, deep mines or quarries. They may be remote and therefore for safety reasons, you, you need to add in further energy resilience for their needs. So, so the customer drivers go way beyond usually the regulated minimum. Yes, and, and I guess that the ability to use renewables in an easier way, in a cheaper way, that, that has benefits that go beyond the, the efficiency and sustainability. So, for instance, the, the ability to bridge the digital divide, to be able to, you, uh, to offer coverage in areas where you do not have coverage other than satellite, uh, might increase because, you know, clearly the cost of building infrastructure in rural area is higher. And part of it is the power infrastructure. So if you have more, uh, you know, um, you know, better, more access to renewables, or it's cheaper, that might also help us with the digital divide, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. I'd also say that for shared sites or shared networks, you need added resilience. You know, if you've only got one site with everybody on it, you might want shared power with a view to added resilience for the site but more capacity as a result of it being a shared site. For a shared network that may well be in a remote area, you may have uh, additional resilience requirements because it is a shared network. If we take, for example, the London Underground, that, that is uh, currently being built as a neutral host network in the deepest and oldest underground in, in, in the world. And as an underground metro scheme, it's not traditionally had underground mobile communications but it will be a neutral host approach, which is built by a company called BAI, and it will offer wholesale uh, uh, services through the mobile operators who will then bill the end customer or the end user. So it's a wholesale retail relationship with a neutral host. They need to add in really strong resilience for the, the energy that uh, is behind their network because it's a single network offered through four operators. Um, Again, there are other neutral host solutions around the world as well. We see that in major ports around the world, uh, also in major uh, entertainment venues and major stadium. So neutral hosts are here to stay, but because they're a shared network, they do require more attention to energy resilience. 
Yeah, and I guess neutral hosts and other type of uh, shared infrastructure, it's, um, again, it, it's not necessarily tied to the how efficient the equipment is, but it's a much more efficient way to use the infrastructure. So I guess that that's really, that's not the way we usually think about it, but those, those are all the ways in which we can, we can be more energy efficient in telecoms by sort of having a broader approach. If you share yes. infrastructure, then you have to obviously think about the other issues, but that, that's a very good way to support that view. Right? Yeah, so also if you have more spectrum and perhaps shared spectrum, you can also think about energy efficiency that way. But I think the main way that people are sharing networks today is through site sharing or network sharing or neutral hosts. Yeah, absolutely. And then there is obviously the issue of, you know, Wi-Fi, indoor, outdoors, North South, Micro South. So there's all sorts of different dimensions that will lead to more or less energy efficient uh, use of network, right? Yes. And if we think about the indoor arena, we make many calls, both from indoors and receiving indoors. So the choices indoors need to increase, but we need to have the right energy resilience and efficiency for indoor use as well as outdoor use. Yes, absolutely. And I guess it's like the whole thing is just like you create the energy efficiency as a different as a, as an additional dimension in which you plan uh, and deploy networks. It, it's just another var variable that in the past we didn't really think much about, quite honestly, right? I, I, I think that is true, but I, I think the data traffic growth and the rise in energy cost per unit are both strong drivers to do more work in this area. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked so far mostly about sort of like the network side, the generation, how you manage it, but there is also interesting issues in terms of the demand because generation is changing but demand is changing too um, and it's not just growing we have like electric vehicles where you have a different way to deliver uh, power it used to be like you know you just have homes and businesses or some fixed entities now with electric vehicles you, you, you the whole thing changes in a dramatic way sure so if we're moving from fossil fuels such as petrol or diesel or gas as it's called uh, to something like electric vehicles we need to know where the charging stations are so that really plays to the strengths of mobile and particularly mapping but we also want to know when are the charging posts available in other words not blocked by another car we also want to know that when we go to that charging station we can build back through that charging station and what do mobile operators do? They're very good at billing and charging. Uh, now, charging can be used in both ways, charging of the vehicle and charging of the bill. Uh, so that feedback loop through communications from the charging post is also a very important area. So whether it's in locating uh, charging posts or checking that they're free and available and working, or maybe charging back the bill, all three of those are roles for the uh, the telcos that they could take on as part of a major rollout of electric vehicle charging stations. It may be that the landlord would like to take control of those charging posts, in which case it may not be a direct relationship with the driver of the car. It might be through the supermarket, for example, or the, the garage chain or the railway station car park mechanisms. But whether it's B2B, business to business, or business to consumer, there are lots of options in the electric charging space. Yeah, and, and I guess that uh, we might just see a, a different uh, different ways to manage this. And then one will get out or there will be multiple ones. So, you know, like with, with mobile payments, you know, for a long time, we didn't know exactly how it would go out, how it would work out. And then tourism so, so maybe we'll see more in terms of experimentation how to do it but clearly somebody has to deal with it well today, opportunity. today we don't have enough charging stations so yeah. that's the first ramp up and i think the payment will be part of that ramp up equation it needs to be made convenient for the consumer or the driver or the landlord of the site um uh, having payment with an app can can be part of the mix, but it, it's got to be led by more charging stations than there are today. 
Yeah, absolutely. But I, but I guess that, you know, sort of in the long term, and electric vehicle might be just one use. I mean, one use case. But we might have something similar. So in the sense that, you know, you might you might need to have similar kind of services. And I guess both for like you know uh, like uh, homes generating and using electricity. So you have all sorts of things that might be a little bit more dynamic than we had in the past. Yes. Imagine if, for example, uh, people want to charge their car in front mm -hmm. of your home. Yeah. How can you maybe provide a service to anybody parking in front of your home who may only be there for half an hour, but you? They may just want to park in front of your house because that's the only park space available for electric charging. Um, you might want to cross charge some energy from your own home supply that might be inside your home rather than outside your home. Uh, you might have visitors, for example. Um, you might want a shared location in a business park or a, or a science park where shared facilities have to be built by individual or by car type. Uh, we, you might also imagine electric charging for other areas such as uh, boats in a, in a port or maybe small aircraft uh, as electrification may apply in aircraft as well. What about the charging for drones? So I think it applies to many vehicles, not just the car as we know it today or the future vehicles on the road. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so there is a, a lot of opportunities that we might not, you know, there might not be a, a suitable market right now. So the market for drones is probably not big enough to even conceive right yet, but eventually it might grow, uh, you know, much more. Now, what about, I mean, in, in general, I guess transport is another interesting vertical along with utilities because everything that is uh, moving out now, I mean, some there is some basic uh, connectivity, but we need more and that not only you need connectivity to vehicles, but that's a way to drive efficiency in whatever they do. I, I so, think it's all it's all driven. And, and certainly yeah. in the freight arena, we see them as early adopters because vehicles on the road, both collecting and delivering is the way they make money. So keeping those vehicles on the road is key. So they're often uh, blessed with a lot of technology uh, that relies on connectivity, whether it's for navigation, whether it's for collection pickups and maps, whether it's for delivery. A lot of that connectivity is in lorries and, and freight today. Uh, that, that's likely to extend to our personal car ownership. In our personal cars today in Europe, we have something called e-call, emergency calling, uh, which is in every new car that's been built over the last three years that's likely to extend to a fuller world of internet on wheels, where you start to imagine you have connectivity to the internet in your car that helps to guide you with better maps, better services, better e-commerce, not as a distraction, but as a, as a tool that helps you uh, do what you need to do in the car. Uh, certainly if you look at modern cars such as Tesla, you know they take much more of an internet on wheels type approach than many other car companies. It's also a world of pre-fit rather than just after fit. So actually the business models by which you get internet on wheels may well change. So uh, what do the fleet vehicles do, for example? Um, are they properly insured? Are they insured by location? If so, uh, how does connectivity play a part in that area? You may get cheaper insurance if you have connected car insurance that might limit your location or numbers of miles you drive. Uh, there are lots of business models that could pay for internet on wheels way beyond the energy supply itself. No, absolutely. And and, uh, and I guess we're just sort of starting to scratch the surface here, or even, even the way we think about it. You know, there's so many things that you can go, but, you know, just uh, giving, for instance, uh, uh, mapping direction directions uh, that are more efficient. So like if you turn, I remember reading about, like if you turn one way or another, you might you know, the, the distance might be the same, but your consumption might be different in ways that are sort of trivial, but nevertheless helpful. So I guess none of these things are really going to be uh, um, changing in a, in a massive way. But when you start thinking about it end to end and you consistently apply this approach, you're going to see much better efficiency. So for instance, even, you know, delivery of goods you know, you, you can just optimize delivery. And for, there's a lot of opportunities there as well. 
Well, well, I think we're just adding more connectivity and intelligence for the driver yeah. or those who are in the vehicle. However, it can give other benefits. It starts mm. to take you into that world of smarter driving where you can avoid traffic jams, but also uh, city authorities can maybe help to minimize traffic jams. Uh, they can start to aggregate the data associated with a number of vehicles more efficiently instead of those physical uh, road counters you see by the side of the road. Uh, sensing the number of cars on the road is a way of managing the efficiency of roads themselves, as well as the congestion to be minimized. Um, you could also imagine that the sensors in the car may report back weather conditions to central authorities almost as a data collector. So there are lots of reasons why there'll be more connectivity and more sensing in vehicles on the road. The same will be true for delivery arrangements. Uh, certainly mapping needs to get more precise than it is today. Uh, and whilst I respect Google Maps and some of the things we, we get with Google Maps, we might want to get into more of a real time world where it's not just about uh, taking a, a view of the past, but maybe a view of the future or maybe patterns that may exist in real time uh, in certain neighborhoods. No, absolutely. So, yeah, so th there is a, a there is a lot and i think the digitalization it's the way you should think about it it's not a, a sort of a two-way street like uh, operators doing something doing an app or developing an app or whatever but all the different players connecting to each other so it's a many-to-many -many relationship but you know as you say it's not just giving better directions is for the city to understand what the problems is with traffic so that it can proactively, if there is a problem today, try to avoid it next time around or solve it in real time. So it's a circular where everybody has to be connected with everybody else and be able to collaborate. Sure. And I think transport and the environment need to be linked uh, more fully than they are today. So thinking about environmental sensing, you know, it can be mobile environmental sensing as well as physical environmental sensing. Uh, you can start to build up patterns that may help you identify uh, environmental change or climate change. You can start to imagine how in cities you could do health alerts based on better uh, environmental monitoring with more precision, uh, where you can alert people not to go out on certain days if uh, the pollution is on the rise. Uh, these sort of alert mechanisms would be helpful in a One Health type world, where we don't just think about the doctor for our own personal health, but we think about the environmental health or the animal health and the risk of crossover into a One Health world. Uh, these alerts and prevention techniques we know about in telecoms, but it really comes down to better sensing than we have today. Absolutely. And so maybe, you know, right now today, I would say that when we think about, especially when people think about monetization and things like that, you think about an app, you think about a service, but with digitalization, we should go beyond that and think about how everything links together. So for instance, like as you mentioned, you know, you might have vehicles, you have sensors and the, uh, the, you, you know, the entities that collect that data are separate, but they need to put, have a way to get everything connected to deliver a better quality. I, I guess it's just a, a better quality of life or more efficiency, which is not this is, it's not just based on a single application. It's based that's on the true. system, right? But that's true. And it's also why I don't tend to use the phrase smart city so much, because that to me has become a bit too generic and vanilla. Whereas actually, if you want a clean city or a green city, or if you want a healthy city, uh, or if you want uh, perhaps a secure city, the world of sensing and connectivity will have a big role in all of those. No, I think it's it, yeah, it, it's it, it's really an important thing, and because you know you're going to have so many sensors of the, so different types, it's really important yeah. to, to really uh, and and the variety. It's really what's uh, uh, going to be uh, uh, very important. Okay, so we talked about uh, utilities, transportation. What else is there that we should really think about? Well, I think the notion of whether it's public or private networks, I think, uh, is secondary to the demand and, and technology can do so much more. But you then got to say, is it cost effective? And sometimes if it's a private network, it may be more cost effective. Um, we will need a 
wider choice of networks, whether they, be, whether they are public or private, whether they are Wi-Fi, cellular or satellite, we will need a wider choice. But at the end of the day, you can't keep building networks unless there's real demand. So understanding the demand is the key to all of this, whether it's to monitor usage, whether it's to be more efficient with energy or more efficient with the capital investment, it all starts with demand. Um, I think this means we need leadership to show uh, certain key areas to be addressed and then agree on what the solution is. Uh, and, and the solution could be a blend of public or private networks or some of the technologies I referred to earlier on. But, but we're getting more and more intelligence in the networks, whatever they are, and across the networks, whatever they are, uh, to help reduce energy and to make society a better place. Now, you mentioned demand, and I think it's it's really important, but it's not that trivial to estimate demand because we know very well use. Use we track. We have historical data and we can predict use. But demand is somewhat tied to availability. So if you'd ask, uh, you know, a while ago, you know, how much video would you be using? People say, well, not a whole lot because they didn't know what to do with it. And so demand is somewhat tied to the availability of networks. So you see what I'm saying? It's like, it could be a little bit tricky. So from an enterprise point of view, yeah, they might have a lot of potential demand, but they don't have it yet because they don't have the network, a network that they control. Yeah, so, so if we take... If we take not spots today, there are some solutions for not spots that can be applied. And, uh, you know, I gave the example of satellite in rural areas, but there are not spots in cities today. Oh, yeah. um, there are also not spots or even black spots, as they're sometimes called, on railway lines today. Um, they need to be addressed. Um, unless you've got reliable connectivity, people won't make calls, voice or data. Um, and if we take each of those modes in, in turn, such as remote rural, well, I think satellite leads the way. But if we take trains, that really has to be intercepting the railway sector's timing. So later on this year, we'll see a lot more 5G trials on trains because of something called FRMCS, Future Rail Mobile Communication System, which is the modern form of signaling that's being promoted here in Europe. And it'll be largely 5G based. Now. If that coverage goes in, it will allow the railway sector to offer so much more for its workers and, and the travellers on the trains. So that to me is a strategy for the railway uh, arena to, to really consider and adopt. Um, but it needs leadership and it probably needs some kind of uh, uh, high level government leadership in that area, uh, supported by the industry investment and innovation that we have. Um, there are some other areas that also need more attention. If you go into many ports, they've got a lot more room for efficiency improvement in ports. How does the boat get monitored on arrival to offload quickly and then to take the next load and then depart? How do you make sure there's quick turnaround? That's very much a communications issue and a sensing issue uh, where satellite and mobile could work together much better than they do today. Uh, so I think in ports, that's another good example of change and investment. Um, there will be other areas, if we look to some hospitals today, they're not really designed from a digital point of view. They're largely designed from the historical health service that may be in hospitals. Now, some hospitals are more efficient with better coverage than others, but often it's good for indoor, but not necessarily for outdoor. And if you have uh, patients coming in and out, you've got to do a blend of indoor and outdoor. So how do you make them more digital hospitals? Uh, there's some work to be done there. If we take some of the big stadia, uh, football or cricket or entertainment venues, they also could do with some more uh, capacity upgrade or uplift, uh, particularly for the big matches that have 30,000 fans or more, you know, in, in a big arena. Uh, they may be in some cases sponsored, but they may not have the capacity to deliver services to everybody. So all of these are locations which could be considered as not spots or near not spots that need some upgrade in terms of investment. Probably neutral hosts will play a part, but also shared networks may play a part, and that will help to improve the efficiency in those locations. Now, you mentioned uh, leaderships and you mentioned specific verticals. Do you see this, this leadership to be mostly primarily or um, uh, an, uh, from a regulatory point of view or from a policy point of view? And also, you know, when you think about a port or a hospital, um, they, they're basically their own entities. And it seems like the benefits to them should be 
how can I say, obvious without having much of a regulation. I mean, it's, it's so, when you look at it, it's like, it's so obvious that you don't need anybody to tell you that you need to do it. If I might be so blunt and yet they're kind of slow moving. So I, I when, think, I think policy we, leadership is needed. And uh, I'm pleased to say in the UK, uh, they've just released a call for demonstrator funding for high capacity venues uh, to really look at what sort of demonstrators would actually show how collaboration and open networks could actually lead the way in this area. Um, I think issues like hospitals and the hospital and railway uh, sectors, I think they need longer term plans uh, and they still need policy developments. Um, I'm not sure it's about regulation, though. I, I think regulation can get in the way. It can be backward looking. Um, so I think it's more policy leverage to move the innovation needle forward that will release investment and solve some of these issues of coverage that exist today. Uh, I'm not just saying this from a UK point of view. I think internationally there are similar major venues that don't have adequate capacity or coverage today as well. No, absolutely. Um, we have uh, a question here on satellite that I wanted to make sure we cover. Is uh, uh, The question is uh, uh, what type of satellite network? So is satellite for rural coverage, Leo, Mio, or Geo? Historically, we've obviously had some Geo and some Mio solutions, but Leo, I think, is the main area of high interest right now, particularly because of the Starlink, OneWeb, Kuiper and Link type initiatives. There are other initiatives as well uh, that may be in other orbits, but I think LEO is nearer to ground and therefore has the potential to be a stronger complement to the cellular services of today. But let me stress, I think we need a blend of Wi-Fi, cellular and satellite to work together, not just satellite. Yeah, and actually, I think that the Wi-Fi is really interesting because we've been talking a lot more about cellular, but Wi-Fi accounts for more traffic than cellular. So, uh, but we have not really been talking, and you know, we want to, I guess, somehow compare the two. Although it's a difficult comparison because the way you use energy is very different from Wi-Fi and cellular. One is wide area network, and one is mm -hmm. indoor. Right? So, how, how do we think about it? Well, I think all three of Wi-Fi, cellular and satellites have their own roadmaps and right. they're not necessarily designed to be fully interoperable. But Wi-Fi and cellular really came together about 12 years ago with the smartphone. Um, the first smartphones that most people identify with the iPhones in 2007, but they didn't have Wi-Fi inside at the beginning. So, so really the Wi-Fi cellular convergence is 12 years. In terms of interoperability, I think... Uh, uh, there's a lot more attention given to uh, Wi-Fi for indoors than in public spaces, but the Wi-Fi roadmap will extend and, and we'll see more uh, Wi-Fi through the roadmap delivery with things like Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7 and, and its evolution. A lot of that does depend on spectrum. Uh, so when we think of energy costs, we have to take into account spectrum. But, but if it's to be a managed service or a highly secure service, I think cellular tends to lead the way. Uh, it's got more robust international standards. It may not be as cheap as Wi-Fi, but it's structured in a different way. But the interoperability between the two has started mainly through the rise of the smartphones 12 years ago. And we see 1.2 billion or so smartphones being shipped every year. So I think really they're joined up at the hip already. Um, but, but what we don't see is the satellite mode being so joined up with cellular right now. But I think we're beginning to see it. There were 57 satellite companies self-declared as satellite uh, capable at Mobile World Congress this year. So that's a sign of a big increase in satellite cellular interest. But I think we still have some way to go to make it fully joined up. Yeah, I guess it, we're at the beginning, but it's incredibly promising. You know, you know, we have, we have satellite forever now, but it never really got to the point where you could really use them easily from your phone, which is really why, you know. Yeah, and, and, and the volume speaks to it. I mean, typically, if we take devices, 1.2 to 1.3 billion smartphones a year, but hardly any satellites sold every year. I mean, how many satellite devices do we need to, to have to make this truly uh, efficient and, and capable? I, I suspect we'll see less than 100 million satellite devices shipped this year. Uh, there's a long way to bridge the gap. Yeah, absolutely. There is another question which actually I wanted to ask you, uh, which is uh, as the telecom industry begins to address energy consumption, 
and efficiency more explicitly? How do you see this evolving? So there are many solutions. Where, where is, well, I guess there are two questions. Is what are the low hanging fruits? And where is the more, more potential in the sort of longer term? I think the low hanging fruit is in A, what we're doing for energy efficiency in the telco world today across networks, Wi-Fi, cellular, satellite, and making sure we measure and manage the energy we use more effectively to add in more resilience and to lower our costs. They, they are low-hanging fruit items in the telco world today. But there's also low-hanging fruit in digitizing the energy supply system and making sure it becomes a strong digital-ready vertical. I also think the strong low-hanging fruit in the uh, transportation vertical uh, along the lines of electric vehicles or internet on wheels. So, so I think it, whether it's in telco land, uh, energy land, or in transport, there's a lot we can do. What about in long term? For instance, if you know, like, okay, I'm, let me ask you a specific question, like risk. So like passive uh, transmission, is there much in there? Well, I, I think longer term there is. I think energy harvesting, we're going to make more of uh, in due course, uh, energy harvesting in different ways. Uh, I think we're going to share energy sources much more fully. Longer term, I think we'll see new fuels such as hydrogen and nuclear play a bigger part. Renewables, there's a lot more to do in, in, in the medium term. Uh, with regard to uh, breakthroughs, I'm sure we're going to see breakthroughs where energy can add in resilience in ways we've not really thought about, um, whether it's through battery storage or um, carbon capture and storage for the environment. I can see other breakthroughs in that whole space. We need to think about net zero coherently across all these verticals in key sectors. What do you mean coherently? Um, instead of looking at within a single sector way, I think the, the boundaries of innovation cross the sector boundaries. So how does telco work with energy? How does telco work with transport? Uh, that requires a coherent approach to systems thinking. Now, you didn't mention on the either long-term or short-term um, AI. So I want to ask you this, because somebody brought up the issue that, you know, if you use the, the more AI you use, AI tend to be uh, sort of heavy on the consumption side as well. In order to learn something, you have to run a lot of learning um, you know, process, there's a lot of processing that goes into the learning. Um, is that energy efficient, you think, or not? Well, or the first, the, not whatever. The, the first requirement for AI is that you you're aiming at using AI with a big data set. And telcos, if they're known for something, it's a big data set. There is a huge data set. You know, it, it generates customer care information, it generates billing information, but it also generates a lot of uh, network planning information to run a network. So telcos have a lot of data, therefore they're well placed in the transition from machine learning to AI. That said, I'm not sure AI is being used as much as it could be in the telco world. And it will be used to help reduce energy consumption. Artificial intelligence applied to data will help guide you to make networks more efficient. AI was certainly highly visible at Mobile World Congress four weeks ago when there were over 10% of all stands, over 10% of 2,500 stands all claimed an AI capability. 250 companies. Now, Clearly, they're not all AI ready, but a large number claim they're ready. And that's a big number of companies in the AI world. So I'm sure we'll see a lot more AI solutions helping to make networks more efficient, whether it's on the energy front, on the security front, or particularly on the innovation front. Now, the, the other thing that, you know, when, when you start thinking about power efficiency, all sorts of things come up and, uh, you know, things like the metaverse and generally the fact that we can do more things virtually. Uh, so, you know, it should lead to power efficiency in other ways because, you know, we might need, we might need to travel less, we might need to, you know, uh, do less things that require, I mean, um, reduce the power consumption in other ways. Uh, but is that how does it balance with the fact that then you're going to need much more wild consumption in the network in order to support metaverse type of services? Well, let me pick up on virtual first. Um, 
The first mobile virtual network operator was launched in the UK many years ago, Virgin Mobile as, as we knew it then. Um, they were building services on the back of somebody else's network. That's a definition of what virtual means. And virtualization or private circuits and private networks have been around in telecoms for many, many years, at least 50 years. In the private circuit world, private circuits have helped build the city of London with all the great city traders. So virtualization will continue, but it also means that you're sharing network resources. And if you're sharing network resources by implication, it's helping to make the assets more efficient in terms of their usage because of sharing. And it's true that virtualization, I think, will improve energy efficiency as well. On the metaverse, I think uh, that's defined differently by many people. And I think we'll see a lot more uh, augmented reality and virtual reality uh, being used in a metaverse type way by businesses first, consumers second. And those businesses will want uh, more remote working, they'll want more secure communications, but they'll also want visualization as well as virtualization for that remote working. Uh, will it consume more energy? Yes, of course it will. But I think it will be virtualized uh, across existing networks, private or public. Um, and that level of virtualization will help with the sharing point I made earlier on to reduce the overall energy per bit or, or energy per base station or something like that. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time, but I have many more questions for you. It's been great talking to you, Mike, and uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, uh, your views with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. And congratulations about uh, your new job, and uh, thank you all in the audience for listening, and uh, Kendra, back to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Monica. That will conclude our webinar for today. Thanks again to our speakers and thank you to our audience members. A on-demand recorded version of today's webinar will be made available on the sensefeely.com website in the coming days, so you can find it there. We have another webinar available for viewing on demand on Vodafone's power efficiency. And that's also available on sensefeely.com. And finally, we have an upcoming sparring partners on the same topic of energy efficiency with Deutsche Telekom, and that will be April 20th. And registration for that will also be available on the sensefeely.com website. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.